Thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed today's service. God is using the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in many people's lives, and we have heard numerous stories of life change. If God has used the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in your life, we would love to hear your story. Please email us at amen at lakesidechurch.ca. I wish my heartbeat was that regular, actually. Uh, we kind of nice, and again, everything we've done this morning is to kind of point us to where we want to go in our uh, talk today, and uh, we want to focus on the heart. But before we jump into what I want to say to you today, I just want us to pause, and I'm going to pray, and then we'll launch into my message. Father, we thank you for just the reminders already of your presence and your closeness and your nearness, of your greatness, of your love and your mercy for us. And f I just pray for every one of us because the reality is, is all of us have faced challenges, are facing challenges, or will face a challenge. And life is filled with them. And Jesus, you said, almost by way of a promise, that in this world that we would have trouble. But may we be able to walk through whatever trouble comes our way in a new and fresh way. Not because of, you know, just sort of psychological information, but because of the truth that you want to speak to us. And so, God, we pray that what we say today, what I say today, will be words that come from your mouth and from your heart for all of us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm sure that when you, you heard the title, Lessons Learned at the End of the Yellow Brick Road, you thought to yourself, where in the world did he come up with that title? Why was that the title for this series? Well, I had been reading devotionally through Philippians chapter 4, and as I read it, I realized that there were three distinct sections of Scripture. And as I read those three sections of Scripture and in my journal labeled what each of the sections were all about, as I read it, it I don't know, maybe it's just because of my, where my head space was, but I thought of my favorite movie as a kid. When I was a little kid, once a year, my grandmother would come up and she'd bring lots of salty and sweet treats and we would get all sort of sugar high and salt fix. And we'd pull out the sofa bed in our rec room downstairs and we would watch together, my siblings and I, The Wizard of Oz. And every year it was this annual tradition. And maybe I love the movie because it's connected with my grandmother and it's nostalgia and all of those kind of things. But I love that movie and there are three characters that I love in that movie. The Scarecrow the Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion. And these three fictional characters all faced a challenge, all faced a struggle, all felt like something was missing, like they needed something more in their lives. And they journeyed with Dorothy and Toto down the yellow brick road, and when they got the, to the end of that road, they found the things that they were looking for. They found the heart that they were looking for, they found the mind that they were looking for, and they found the courage, the heart and the mind and the courage. And in Philippians chapter 4, the writer Paul, who is in prison who is going to be tried, and the likely outcome of this trial could be execution. He knew that was happening. And Paul sits down like a pastor to people that he loves, and he begins to write a letter. And he writes a letter to people who are going through their own kind of persecution, their own personal struggles. There, there's isolation, alienation, simply because they have chosen to follow Jesus. And he writes to this group in a city in, called Philippi. And just because they were Christ followers, they faced huge amounts of difficulty and challenges and trials. It's kind of like what's going on in the Middle East right now. That when you choose to follow Jesus, it can mean that you're shunned and isolated from family and friends. If you own a business, you can be boycotted or it could be burned. They were often scapegoats. If there was any trouble in the city, they always blamed the Christ followers. They were often tossed in prison for periods of time for no real reason other than to intimidate all because of their faith. And on top of the persecution that these people were facing, they had their own life issues, life issues like all of us face. They had issues with their health, relationships, jobs, kids, emotions, money, etc. And so Paul, very pastorally, to this group of people going through difficult circumstances, he's in his own circumstances, describes in detail how to have the right heart, 
the right mind and to find the right kind of courage so that you can face tough and challenging times. And as I say, Paul wrote this to them, and I think that although he wrote it 2,000 years ago, so the wisdom that he shared, the insights that he delivered through this letter have practical application to us today. Now the overarching theme of the entire book of Philippians is found in Philippians 1.27. Paul says these words, whatever happens, whatever, whatever happens in your life, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how difficult it gets, I want you to conduct yourself or act in a manner, in a way that is worthy, that is a reflection of the good news of Jesus Christ. He says that's the overarching theme. No matter what goes on, this is about living a life that is a reflection of who Jesus is and how Jesus would handle it. And so today we're going to look at the right heart in the middle of challenging times. Now, when the New Testament uses the word heart, it's a Greek word, cardia. We get cardia from that, or cardiac. And cardia was never used uh, to describe the blood pumping muscle in the chest in the New Testament. It was always used metaphorically or figuratively, and it always referred to the center of the being, the spiritual, the emotional center of the human being. It, is, it included desires and emotions and passion, dreams, hopes, but it is also includes will. In fact, the heart was the decision-making center because it is the heart that, cho- uh, that controls the choices and the decisions we make. A couple of years ago, uh, two brothers wrote a book, Dan and Chip Heath, and the book was called Switch, and it was how to make people change. And in that, they used this metaphor of the elephant and the rider. And they said the rider, he was the, uh, he's the mind, and the elephant, the elephant is the heart. And when the heart decides where it's going to go, the mind has no control over it. And that's so often true. And that's why the word heart is really about this center of decision making, the center of will in the, in the human psyche. And so what I want to do today is just kind of read this entire section. It's very short, but I want to read this section that deals with the heart. And this is what the writer Paul says. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, what he is saying here is that the ultimate outcome that we need to look for is not a change in circumstances. It's not that the struggles sort of disappear. It's not that the challenges kind of leave or stop or cease. He's saying the ultimate outcome is not that. We think it should be, and we would like it to be, but he says the ultimate outcome is this, that the peace of God which transcends all understanding will be experienced by you. He's saying the ultimate outcome is that you will have a peace that doesn't make any sense compared to what you're going through. You'll have this peace that you don't know where it came from, you don't know how you got it, and you shouldn't have it because of the difficulty and the challenges you go through. See, the reality is, tough times happen to all of us. None of us are immune. Sometimes they're serious. Sometimes they suck the wind right out of our soul. Sometimes they're so overwhelming and so emotionally draining, we don't even know how to move forward. But he said the goal is not to eliminate the circumstances. We think that's what we want the goal to be. But he says that's not the goal. The outcome is to experience the kind of peace inside of us that makes no sense at all. And the reason that the inside is more important than the outside is that sometimes these struggles and these challenges and these trials, they last for years and years and years and years. Sometimes they can almost last a lifetime. And if we're waiting for them to to find relief from them, we will never enjoy the kind of life we're looking for if that's what we think the ultimate goal is. On top of that, Sometimes troubles come and troubles go, but once they go, there's always other troubles lurking around the corner. It's just what it means to live in a fallen world. Jesus said, in this world, in this age, in this era, you will experience trouble. And Paul wants them to experience a kind of peace that makes no sense compared to what they're going through, and that it will guard their heart. That it will guard their heart. That this peace will guard their heart. 
Because hard and difficult seasons of life can affect your heart. They can affect your passions, emotions, desires, hopes, dreams, and choices. And Paul knows how critical the heart is. Maybe as a little Jewish boy, he was taught the Proverbs. And maybe he remembers this proverb that it says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. He's saying that everything flows from the condition of your heart. Critical heart leads to critical choices and actions. A negative heart makes you negative in other areas of your life. A selfish heart leads to selfish choices. A gentle heart leads to gent gentleness in other areas. A kind heart leads to kindness in other areas of our lives. The, the condition of our heart bleeds out into every other area of our lives. And difficult times can affect our heart. We use words like heartbreak, heartache, wounded heart, broken heart. And it has a way during difficult times to bleed out into other areas of our life. I mean, think of a recent challenge you faced or a crisis that you experienced. You know it did something to your heart. And you know it bled out into other areas of your life. Maybe it affected you at work. Or maybe it influenced your attitude towards others. Or maybe how you related to others. Or maybe your emotional well-being. When someone does something out of character, I often find myself saying, yeah, but you've got to remember what they're going through. Because what we go through affects our heart. And when it affects our heart, it affects the other areas of our lives. And Paul says that we need to have a kind of heart that has this kind of peace in it that makes no sense. No sense at all compared to what we're going through. Even when we feel overwhelmed and we don't know where to turn or what to do, he says that you can find a peace in your heart that makes no sense and it will guard your heart and it will guard what flows out of your heart. The writer of Proverbs, one of the wisest people who ever lived, wrote, said things like this, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. He went on and said, a happy heart makes the face cheerful. You can see it on the face of a person when they have the right heart. But heartache crushes your spirit. And Paul says the ultimate goal is to find peace. The right heart is a peaceful heart. The right heart is a guarded heart, guarded by peace. And I think all of us need to understand this because I know there are three groups. We could divide this room into three sections today. First section is, is those who just went through a trial. The second section would be those who are neck deep in the middle of a, some tough time right now. And the third group are those who are ready to enter tough times because it happens to all of us. And it's because it's happening to all of us, because it's so important how we go through it, I want it to be incredibly memorable today. So I'm going to give you four words that all start with the same letter. And it'll become a little mantra. When you go through tough times, and even when you don't, it would be pretty good to practice these four every day. And then I'm going to use four props. I've got them here on stage. So I can drive the point uh, home, because these four props are stuff you touch every day as well. Because I think that we all go through this, and we all experience this, and we need these reminders when we do what to do. So the first word starts with R. They all start with R. First word is the word rejoice. Rejoice. That's what he says. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I say again, rejoice. Now, when he says the word rejoice, he's not talking about manufacturing some kind of happiness because of sheer willpower. He's not talking about pasting on a plastic smile. When you're going through the most difficult times and people say, how are you doing? You go, fine. It's not what he's talking about. It's not about pretending. He's not talking about finding joy in the circumstances. He's Because there is no joy inherently in the circumstance. I mean, when your marriage melts down and your kids are off the charts and you lose a job or miss out on a promotion, you're drowning in debt and have to declare bankruptcy or someone, some dream that's important dies or someone you love dies or your health is poor and the prognosis is not promising. There is no joy in that. He's not saying find joy in those circumstances because there isn't any. But too often the church in the past believing that it was a sign of faith forced people to deny the pain that they were feeling, and to pretend to be joyful, to pretend. 
And it was all an act, and it was not an overflow of the heart. It did not come from peace that transcends all understanding. They just said, well, I've got to be joyful because it's a sign of faith. I think that part of rejoicing is at first admitting that there's pain and struggle and heartache and heartbreak. One of my favorite heroes of faith was a pastor who lived in the 1800s. I wish I, you know, people often ask, who would you like to meet if you ever could, dead or alive? This is one of the guys. His name is Charles Spurgeon, and he had a church in London in the 1800s. And it was a church that I think kind of looks like Lakeside today. And yet he, because of the stress of this ministry, faced significant depression. And this very public figure could have said, I have to pretend, everybody better see, I've got it all together. Everybody better know that I'm not struggling with anything. But that's not what he chose to do. And this is right out of one of his sermons. Listen to what he says in the middle of it. I am the subject of depression of spirit, so fearful that I hope none of you ever get such extremes of um, wretchedness as I go. But I always get back again by this. I know I trust Christ. I have no reliance but in him. And if he uh, falls, I shall fall with him. But if he does not, I shall not. Then he goes on. Because he lives, I shall live also. And I spring to my legs again and fight with my depression of spirit and my downcasting and get the victory through it. And so may you do, and so you must, for there is no other way escaping from it. In your most depressed seasons, you are to get joy and peace through believing. Do stick to this, dear friends. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. My favorite line is this one that says that we find joy and peace through believing. Joy and peace through believing. See, the Bible seems to indicate that joy is something we choose more than something that happens to us. But how do you do that when your world seems like it's crumbling around you? How do you choose joy? Well, Spurgeon would say it's through believing. See, it's not about having the right feelings that bring about joy. It is having the right beliefs that bring the kind of joy that we can experience in the middle of difficult times. Let me say that again. It is not about the right feelings, experiencing the right feelings. It's about believing the right thing. And in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, he says, Consider it pure joy, not just any kind, but undiluted. My brothers and sisters, wherever you face trials of many kinds. The word consider here is the word about using your mind. It's about thinking. It's to see how things add up. And then he says, because you know. The word is about knowledge. You see, James knew that when you go through difficult times, how you endure and persevere is not because of what you experience in feeling. It's what you know in your thinking. And I believe we can have inner joy when the bottom drops out of our lives because our joy is based on facts or realities or what we know, not trying to muster up some kind of an emotional feeling because that's impossible to do. It's believing over feeling. So what are the facts or realities that help us rejoice. I'll go through these real quick. The first one is there's a promised outcome. Scripture gives us the promised outcome. The writer Paul writes to people going through struggles in Romans 8, and he says, and we know that all things, good, bad, and ugly, no matter how bad it stinks, that's right in that little square, that's where it said that. God works for the good. The outcome is what? Not all things, the outcome is good. It ends up as good. Good is the ultimate outcome. That's what he says here. Now, the good may be a long way out, and the good might be hard to recognize, but the promise is that the ultimate outcome of whatever we go through is good. That's the promise of God. And so we have that reality that whatever I'm going through, there's an ultimate good. Sometimes it's hard to see, and sometimes it's a long way out. But it's the ultimate outcome. Second thing he says is that that's the purpose they produce. It's the reminding of the purpose that they produce. The purpose they produce. He says this, James, we read it. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. See, part of the purpose of going through difficult times is you become perseverant. You hang in there. And I often think, that we develop perseverance in one trial because God knows a greater trial is coming. And he wants us to be able to hang into this one so we, we get the strength, you know, our persevering muscles, our exercise, so we can face 
something else. Then he goes on. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This is a little phrase in the ancient Near East in the first century. Mature, complete, not lacking anything. Used often to, to, to talk about character. And what he says is you have this perseverance, but it is, it, it's, it's a refining of your character. It's building character. It's God using his chisel. Sometimes it's big and sometimes the blows are hard. But God is using the chisel of circumstances to refine our character. That's the outcome. We have this endurance and we have this character change. Paul says something similar in Romans 5. Not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know it's something, it's what we think. Suffering produces perseverance, that's what James said. Perseverance changes character, that's what James says. And character develops what? Hope. Character develops hope. You see, we go through it, we see God in it, and we see God working, and we see God bring out the good, and we go, okay, God did that. The next time we go through something that's difficult, we go, I can get through this because I have hope, because I saw it in the previous trial. And this is what it produces. The third thing is that it's a reminder that we're God's children. When you go through trials, it is a reminder that that's who you are. The writer of Hebrews, who we don't know who it is, says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. He says, when you go through some hardship, it is God disciplining you sometimes. Not all the time, sometimes. And God's treating you as sons and daughters. For what son is not disciplined by his father? Or fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. But it's painful. But later on it produces, it produces a harvest of righteousness. In other words, it produces the kind of life all of us want to live because we make the right choices. And it produces peace for those who have been trained by it. You see, I believe that God does discipline us as his children. Hey, dads, that's your role with your children, to discipline them as you see fit and as you do best. I think we could do a better job at that sometimes. But discipline makes us better. And the discipline is a reminder that God is our father. Not some cold and distant deity, but he is close. He is a father who loves us, and we are his children, and he brings these things to discipline us. And then the last thing that we need to know is that we have the power to overcome. This is, this is a huge. It, my favorite, one of my favorite verses is, I have told you these things, Jesus speaking, should be in red. I have told you these things, so that in me you will have what? Peace. He's all talking about peace. In this world, Jesus says, you'll have trouble. It's a promise. But he says, take heart, let it affect your heart. I have overcome the world, and because I've overcome the world, and I have the power to overcome the world, I have the power to rise from the dead, and because I have that power, you can have that power to overcome as well. We have the power to overcome. And so this is kind of the four things that we need to know in order to rejoice. Here's the first prop. Now, this is the one that some of you will use the least in your day. It's a little five-pound weight that you would exercise with. I can't use it in this hand but I'll use it my right hand, or my left hand. And this weight reminds me that trials come and we rejoice because they produce strength. You know, this arm is driving me crazy. Just ask my wife, it's driving her crazy as well. I know that in five weeks, this crazy sling, which is becoming my best friend, is going to disappear. And then I'm gonna go to the gentle uh, you know, care of someone who will do some physiotherapy. You laugh because you've been through it. And they're going to make me take weight to strengthen an arm that has become weak so that it's good as or maybe even better. In fact, I said to the doctor that if he could just put the tendon the right way when he reattaches it, that it would remove the slice in my golf game. That would be awesome. And I'm hoping that will happen and that the strength will make me stronger. I'll be able to hit the ball farther. At least that's what I'm thinking. So when you, if you exercise at all, do something that builds up strength, remind yourself daily that there is a rejoicing that comes because of what it produces. It produces some kind of strength. The second word is the word respond. It is the word respond. And this is what Paul says. Let your gentleness be evident to all. 
going through difficult times, he says these words. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The word gentleness means to be big-hearted. It means to be willing to forgive when you would rather retaliate. It means to be gracious, an attitude of kindness. It's the willing to yield your personal rights to show consideration to another person. That's what this word means. And so when life throws you a, a curveball and it sort of smacks you right in the gut and it kind of leaves you breathless, it is easy to want to take it out on somebody else. A lot of the reasons we face trouble and trials and struggles is because of someone else. And if you're in the middle of one right now, you can even see the face of the person that's caused it. And our default reaction is to want to get even. It is to want to retaliate, to blame, to hold a grudge, to turn it into bitterness and resentment. That's our default. That's where we seem to want to go. I'm telling you, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment are a poison to the soul, and they never produce a peaceful heart. Paul says, choose gentleness, choose graciousness, choose kindness. Don't retaliate. That's where you find peace. That's not easy. It's not where I want to go early in the process. I want to get even. He said, but be gentle. No matter what they've done, be gentle. Yield your right. Exercise forgiveness. Don't hold a grudge. Don't be bitter. Sometimes in the middle of struggles, when we're feeling the pain and the hurt and the woundedness, our response to others can be negative. When we're struggling, I think the default mode sometimes can be to lash out at others, out of our own pain. We hurt others and wound others because we've been wounded. And then we say things we later regret and make choices we wish we could take back. And it leaves us feeling guilty and shame and regret. Nothing like, none of those make us peaceful or create joy. And he's saying we need to show gentleness. We need to be gracious, kind. But when you're hurting, it is not easy. What motivates me? has for a while, is one image in two phrases. The image is a picture of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. That had to be painful. That had to be horrific. I don't think anything I've ever gone through has ever come close to what he went through. And while Jesus hung on the cross, awaiting his certain death, he looks out over the crowd and he uses this phrase and he says, Father, forgive them. Are you kidding me? Me on the cross, it's a good thing I didn't go. I'd be going, hey, Father, let's get even with this group. Let's bring down the lightning bolts. Let's bring the hurricane. Let's bring the storm. Let's, you know, bring the plague. Let's do whatever. Let's get even. I don't deserve this. I'd go there. But Jesus doesn't. He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And I have this image of gentleness. The second phrase, well, Jesus is on the cross, is to a thief that's on one side of him. And he looks at that thief and he says, today you will be with me in paradise. He, you know, Jesus didn't deserve to die, but that thief did according to their law at that day. He was likely a murderer. And Jesus looks at this murdering thief and he could have said, you're getting what you deserve. Look, at I didn't deserve it, but you're getting it. And he could have berated him and he could have wounded him and it would have been an eternal wound. But Jesus looks at this thief and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And Jesus is gracious in his own pain, in his own suffering, in his own struggle to another human being. And I see that image in those two phrases, and it's what motivates me. Now you could say, yeah, but I'm not Jesus. Neither am I. But, but the writer here, the writer here, Paul, in an earlier section, when he's talking about gentleness and consideration and yielding our rights, he says your attitude should be the same attitude as Jesus. And that's the goal. We're not going to get it perfect, and it can be a challenge, but that's the goal. Because peace comes when you extend forgiveness, when you shake off bitterness, when you remove resentment, when you're gracious. Psychological, psychological research shows when you're in the middle of your pain, one of the things that's best to do is to go and care for someone else in their pain. Show gentleness. Because it helps you endure that tough time. And so my prop today is this nice, white, fluffy towel. And my hope is that when you shower every morning, and that's my hope that you do actually shower every morning. So are the people's hope beside you. Uh, but my hope is that when you put a towel and so feel that soft towel on your body every morning, that you'll start your day thinking, no matter whether I'm going through a tough time or not, I'm going to be gentle. Imagine every day if you did that thought, oh, oh yeah, I've got to be gentle. I've got to be gentle. That's going to be my response no matter what. And so that's our second prop. The third word 
is the word relax. Relax. That's what Paul says. Second part of this. The Lord is near. It's the knowledge of the presence of God through difficult times. You know, sometimes when you go through difficult times, I get it. It is hard to feel God's presence. Sometimes we wonder, has he left the building? Has he abandoned us? Jesus thought that on the cross. Jesus felt that. God had not abandoned him. That's, and any teaching is wrong in that regard. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had not forsaken him. Jesus has felt that in his humanity. And we do at times. And it's the reminder that the Lord is near. He's close. God is no, never more present than when we go through difficult times. The writer in Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close, close, and close means closer than normal to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That's when God's the closest, when we go through the most difficult times. And we need to remind ourselves of the presence of God because it's in the presence of God that we have a sense of peace. It's in the presence of God we get the sense of rest. It's in the presence of God that we find refreshment. It is in the presence of God that we find calmness of soul. It is in the presence of God that we find what we need to endure. And so we need to remind ourselves of the presence of God because God has not left the building. God is there. We need to remind ourselves of it. See, when life turns upside down, we have a choice. We can run from God, we can blame God, we can distance ourselves from God, we can be mad at him, we conclude there is no God. We can go that far. We can reject God. Lots of people make that choice. I often have people say, I don't believe in God. And my next question to them is, when did God let you down? Because so often those who don't believe felt let down by God because that's sometimes our default mode. We can choose to run from God, or we can choose to run to God and to sense his presence and to rest and relax in his presence and find joy and peace and calmness in his presence. When Heather, who sang here at the beginning, was a little girl, she hated loud noises, fireworks, you name it. Thing she hated the worst loud noises was thunderstorms. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but thunderstorms always happen in the middle of the night. And Heather would come to our door, and she was terrified. And Sue, being the more rational, logical one, would convince Heather why the thunderstorm wasn't going to hurt her, and it's going to be okay, and it'll be over soon. Just go back to bed. Sue never sold that one. She tried, but never could sell that deal. Me, I did not want to get into that. I just said, Psst, you in with your mom, me in your bed. That's what we did. And when Heather would get into bed with Sue and quickly would fall asleep, why? Not because the storm disappeared, but because of the presence of one who was with her in the storm. And that's why we need to sense the presence of God no matter what storm we go, because it's not that the storm disappears, it's the presence of one who is with us in the storm. And the size of our God determines the size of our peace. And if we have this little bitty God who we don't think can handle it, we're not going to have much peace. But if we have faith in a God who created this universe, and we have faith in a God who raised his son from the dead, has that kind of power. We need to rest in the presence of that God. And so the third prop is this one. It's a plug outlet. It's not plugged into anything, so I won't electrocute myself here this morning. But it's a, you'll use this every day. I bet you plug something in almost every day. Here, wouldn't it be great that when you plug something in, no matter when it is in the day, you reminded yourself, oh yeah, God is present. God is near. And I plug, I plug into the power of God. Just imagine if you did that every day, no matter what you're plugging in. You just could twig your memory to go, oh yeah, God's present. God is near. The final word, the final word is the word request. It is the word request. And the writer Paul says these words. Do not be anxious. Now, for those of you who think this is a command that if you are anxious that you're disobeying and sinning, think again, that's not what he's saying here. It's not a command, it's just an encouragement. Do not be anxious. He's saying do not be overly concerned or unduly concerned or preoccupied with that which troubles you. Don't be anxious about anything, nothing. But in everything, this word really means nothing. Don't be anxious about nothing. Just wasn't good grammar when they translated. But in everything, it's not a, don't be anxious about nothing, but in everything. It's a kind of a comparison. He says, in everything, 
by prayer. The word prayer here is an act of worship. It comes before God. Prayer is this word prayer. is I come before God and I acknowledge who God is. And I remind myself of his presence and that he is there. So it's an act of worship and petition. That's just a list of the things we want to pray about. He says, so you come and worship, reminding yourself of who God is, and you give God the list. But you do it with thanksgiving, and thanksgiving is saying, hey, by the way, God, I know you can handle this. And the idea of thanksgiving here is the idea of surrender. It's the idea of saying, hey, God, I give it all over to you. He says, so this is what we do. He's saying we do that, and we present our request to God. Basically, what he is saying is worry about nothing and pray about everything. Now, the word present or present, rather, the word present, it's, it's a word picture, and it's the idea of having a ball. And I, when I present the ball, if I throw it down to Frank, I throw it, Frank catches it, hopefully. But when I throw it and I send it to Frank, I release my hands from it. The word present means once we throw it, we release our hands from it. You see, too often, but that requires surrender and trust and release, doesn't it? Too often our default mode, when we get anxious, let me fix it all. Let me sort it out. Let me control it. Let me prevent it. Let me work it all out. And sometimes you've got the strength to do some of that. It's usually a second-rate solution, but you can find a solution. But sometimes it's bigger than us, our, our ability to handle. And life throws us a curveball, and what he says is, when you grab that curveball, you throw it this way, and you release it, and you let it go to God. You let it go to God. And so my prop for this one is my cell phone. Get, can you get that on the camera? It's my picture of my grandson, just wanted to show you. There you go. There you go. I want to use the prop as a cell phone. And I want you to imagine that when you present a request to God, it's like writing a text. Have you ever written a text, and then you push send, and then you read it and went, oh my goodness, spell check, change it to whatever. You have no control over it once you send it. Imagine every time you picked up your phone and sent a text. For some of you, it would be like prayer without ceasing. But imagine <laughs> if that was the case. Imagine that every time you put a text in and you sent it, you reminded yourself, oh yeah, I can bring requests before God, and if there's something this small, even small right now, that's in my soul that I'm kind of struggling with just a little, I can present that request to God. Think about what that would do if you could remind yourself of that every day when you send a text. You see, rejoicing comes because we know the right things, right? We're reminded that good things work for good. That God is building up strength in our lives. That we have the power to overcome. And he's doing it because we're his kids and he wants to make us better. We need to respond and we need to do it with gentleness. We need to relax reminding ourselves of the presence of God. And we need to request. We need to release those requests over to God. That could be our little mantra. Imagine if that was your little mantra. Rejoice. Respond, relax, request. Rejoice, respond, relax, request. Imagine if you put that in your mind. Whether you go through tough times or not, those are good things. And the next time you go to the gym next January, <laughs> whatever you touch, something heavy. You went, you know what? I need to rejoice. You shower in the morning. I need to respond as Jesus would respond. You plug something in. I need to relax because God is present. When you send a text, you need to say, you know what, I'm going to present this request to God. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. You produce that, and you will have a heart of peace no matter what's going on in your life. No matter what. Whether there's big things or small things, you do these things that I've said today. You will have a heart of peace no matter what you're going through. And imagine what difference it would make if you remember that little mantra and you do this little practice. Imagine the difference it will make the next time you face challenging circumstances. Let's pray together. Father God, this morning, I love how simple it is. You don't make it complicated. You give us four th simple things that we are to rejoice 
in the Lord, not in our circumstances, not in our pain, but in you because of who you are and what you do and what you produce, that we are to practice gentleness, that we are to respond with gentleness, no matter what. That's what you want. That we are to relax in the sense of your presence, no matter what we go through. And whenever something happens, we are to bring those requests to you and release it to you. How simple can that be? And I pray for everyone here going through tough times right now, that you would give them that peace, that peace that transcends all understanding. No, that makes no sense. They won't manufacture it. It simply comes when they do those four things. Lord, give us peace. And may we feel it and sense it even in this moment. And for those who are struggling right now, may they hold in their hands that which they struggle with. And may they be reminded in the song that we'll sing as we close to just Bring it to you because you are near. You are near. And may we feel your nearness even during this song now. In your name we pray. Amen. Draw near, I draw. 
So maybe in what you're going through this morning, maybe there is a challenge or a struggle or trial and you just need to say, hey God, here it is, draw near. I need to feel your presence in the middle of it. It's just a simple prayer that he will draw near. Maybe you want someone to pray with you about that. There'll be some people at the front here and you can come on down and they'll pray with whatever you're going through. But let's remind ourselves that we have a God that draws near, he's powerful, he's strong, and he can make a difference to whatever we're going through. God bless. Have a great week. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this message. To hear it again or other messages, please visit us at lakesidechurch.ca.